With that, my name is Adam, and uh, I'm really glad you're here today. I'm glad God woke you up and brought you here as we conclude this series called Life in Exile. We've been examining the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, the last two history books of the people of God before the New Testament. And we've been examining this story, looking through the lens of what was God doing in them and teaching to them as they were regathering for the first time in 70 years. As they were coming back together as God's people, what was God doing? And maybe as we regather and we come back together and we seek life together, what should we be doing as well? And so far, three things we've seen through these two books, which at one point were one book and were later split into two. So when you read them, you should read them as one continuous narrative, Ezra and Nehemiah together. So far, what we've seen God do is invite the people into worship, specifically through the building of a temple, a place that they could go where God promised to meet them. And not only did he promise to meet them, they could go to that temple to offer sacrifices, to receive the forgiveness of sins, to be made new and right with God for all the things they'd done in the past. Not only was God drawing them into worship, he was challenging them with prayer. Turn back to me, come to me, talk to me. I will be your God and I will answer you. I will hear your every need and your every plea. And then last week we looked at this reality that when we come back together and we join with God in what he's doing, we can only do that if we're centered in scripture, in his words. That it's not about how great the music sounds or how awesome the coffee is or how much you like me. It's not about what you feel or think or get from our time together. It's about God speaking to us in his word. God revealing himself to us through the things that he says. And in turn, us submitting every part of our life to him. Today, as we continue in this, Ezra and Nehemiah are faced with a difficult reality. See, as the people turn back to God and they seek to do what is holy and what is right, and they seek to honor God, what they discover quickly is that a lot of their life in this time in exile, is not honoring God. Specifically, in one area in particular, marriage. So, we're going to begin by looking at Ezra chapter 9. I forgot to actually look up the page number. Any chance you did, Aaron? Okay. I've been trying to put the page number in those Bibles there in front of you, and I forgot. So the first person who finds it, if you'll just shout out the page number, interrupt me if you need. Uh, Feel free to use the Bibles in front of you. For those of you on the balcony, there's some on the sides for now, but eventually we'll get some more for you. Feel free to use your phone or your own Bible and follow along. Ezra chapter 9. Anybody there yet? 494. If you're following along in the Bibles in your pews, 494. Thank you, Adam. All right. After these things had been done, real quick, Anytime you read an after this, you should read what came before that, all right? So after these things, what happens beforehand is the Levites, the priests, are established and they set up an order so that they can pray, they can uh, take care of the temple, they begin to fast and pray for God to care for them, they set up guards to guard the offering and guard the temple to make sure that nothing would come in between them and their worship. And now that they've established this system and this structure for them to come and meet with God, after this... After these things have been done, the officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations, from the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites, the Jebusites and the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Egyptians and the Amorites, for they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons. So that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and chief men has been foremost. Huh? Well, let's just for a moment back up. Let's consider the the challenge in front of them. 
Over the course of 70 years, there were some who stayed in the land and many who were in exile. And during that time, per the encouragement of Jeremiah, they took for themselves wives and they took for themselves husbands and they began to get married and have families as God commanded. And yet, there's also another nuance and a challenge that they had forgotten about. See, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, God is speaking to his people and telling them about the promised land they're getting ready to inherit, this good land before them. And this is what he says in chapter 7, you shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. See, there is this reality that intermarrying with people of other cultures could be a problem. Now, this has been misapplied to say interracial marriages are bad. That's not what's happening here. Because we see in the Old Testament plenty of other marriages with people that are not Jewish. Like, consider Ruth, the Moabite, who's in the line of David, the line of Jesus, as one of his ancestors. Or consider Esther, who at about the same time period as this, was married to the Persian king. Right? The Old Testament is filled with other people being brought in. In fact, God's story was never an exclusive story about the Israelites. It was always about the Israelites being a means for all people to be blessed and to be brought in. So the problem is not specifically uh, marrying another culture, another person, or interracial marriage. That's not the issue here. Rather, that second verse in Deuteronomy, they would turn away your sons from following me. The concern in marrying these other people groups was that by doing so, you begin to become like them. And when you begin to become like them, you begin to do the things they do and hold to the things they hold to and love the things they love. And maybe in all of that, you'll forget who God is, the God who's called and redeemed and rescued these people, his people. Now, we all know that in marriage, we become like the people we marry, right? Right? Like if you spend any time around a couple who's been married for 50 years, they might finish each other's sentences and also sandwiches. They might actually say things that the other one was saying and you're like, where did that phrase come from? That's so weird. And sometimes they begin to even look alike. But it's not just when you're married that you begin to look like others. Like just whoever you love or whatever you love, enough time eventually you begin to look like them. Like this picture here, right? Whoever you love, whatever you spend the most time with, eventually you're going to start to take on their traits and their habits and and even physically be like them. And so God had commanded his people, don't intermarry with all of these foreigners because you're more likely to become like them than they are to become like you. This same theme is picked up in the New Testament in Corinthians where it, it describes being unequally yoked, and this idea that when we marry somebody who's not like us, it's going to be really difficult to remain who we are, specifically in the context of faith. I've heard it said many times, well, I know that my boyfriend or my fiance or that my spouse doesn't love Jesus. That's okay. I'll love Jesus and that'll be enough. And maybe eventually I'll, I'll change them or fix them or they'll learn to love Jesus too. Let me tell you, you will not succeed in fixing or changing your spouse, probably. Probably. In fact, if you're in a dating relationship and you, there's a whole lot of things that you're not okay with, and you're like, they'll change when we get married. Run. They will only get worse when you get married, I promise. So coming back to Ezra. During that time in exile, the people have married all of these foreigners. They've given themselves in marriage to relationships that were not centered in God to relationships that were centered in who knows what else. Maybe their marriages were for money or for power or for love or maybe their marriages were because that that spouse was really pretty. Uh, I'm coming up in just about a week on nine years of knowing my wife 
And, and when I first met her, before I even knew her name, she walked in the room and I was like, that's my wife. Like one day I'm going to marry that woman. And I had no idea who she was. Thankfully, God was better than me and he worked it out. And we got married quick enough that she couldn't say no because she didn't know who I was. And for eight years now, she's been wondering what she got into. But sometimes we get married simply because we really like the way the other person looks or the way they make us feel or the things about them that are bound to change over time. In fact, a week after we got married, the first time we went back to church, we had three different people at church who said, wow, Adam, marriage has been good to you, right? Like assuming that in a week I gained all the extra weight that I had, you will change in your marriage. Most of those 30 pounds came later thanks to a lot of different things. But back to Ezra. The officials and the leaders are concerned because now as they're looking at scripture and God's word, as they're praying, as they're seeking him, they're seeing their marriages don't line up with what he commanded. What do we do? Verse three, as soon as I heard this, I being Ezra, as soon as Ezra heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. There's a reason why most married men, given enough time, become bald, right? He tears his hair from his head. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel, because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles, gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn and fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. See, Ezra, he sees the state of the relationships and the marriages of the people, and he's distraught. He's appalled. These marriages are not what God intended. They don't look at all like they're supposed to. These marriages are disastrous, and we know what happens when we don't honor God bad things. In fact, we're just coming out of a season of exile, 70 years in a foreign land because we weren't honoring God. And in our return, we're still not doing it right. What do we do? So Ezra, he comes before God in prayer. This is what he says. Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you. My God, For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. He begins his prayer, God, I am embarrassed and ashamed to even come before you. How could we be this bad that our sins are higher than our heads? We're drowning in this wrongdoing. We've made a mess of what you've given to us. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plundering, and to utter shame as it is today. Ezra sees the state of these marriages, and he recalls the pain they've been walking through. God, because we are not honoring you, we've been given over to our enemies, We've been made the shame of the earth because we're not doing it the way you intended for us to do. But now for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within his holy place that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery. For we are slaves. Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. Ezra, he continues his prayer, God, we are in utter shame and brokenness, and even still you've given us favor. Even still you've saved a few to restore us to bring us out of that place and into this land you've promised. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets. 
saying the land that you are entering to take possession of it is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples of the lands and with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanliness. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take your daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. He here quotes from Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. He quotes from Scripture, says, God, look, in our shame, we're doing the very thing you said not to do. We're living exactly like you warned us, don't live like that. And yet we would think you would be for us. In the midst of this protection, in the midst of all your good, that you are returning us to this land, we continue to dishonor you, God. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and our, for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved and have given us such a remnant as this, shall we break your commandments again and intermarry the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us so that there should be no remnant nor any to escape? O oh Lord, the God of Israel, you are just, for we are left a remnant that have escaped as it is today. Before, behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. In Ezra's prayer, he continues, look, after all that you have done, this is how we'd repay you, God, by choosing our way and not yours by dishonoring your command, by living, pursuing our desires, will you be angry with us? He says, look, our sins, we were not repaid for our sins with what we deserved, but instead you had mercy and you saved some of us. Do you see the pain and the dilemma Ezra's walking through? God, you have commanded we honor you and that our relationships honor you, that our relationships are centered in you and we guard that and we allow nothing to come between that. And yet, even after all that you've done for us, we keep doing it our way and not yours. Ezra's thoroughly broken. See, it's really easy to think about marriage the way we think in this world. Marriage is about two people coming together, husband and wife who love each other. So as long as you love each other, that's enough, isn't it? We often think marriage is about two people completing the other. You complete me. Hardly. If anything, I complicate Laura. I make it way worse for her. We often think that marriage is just about two people not being lonely. And yet, if your solution to loneliness is getting married, you're gonna find yourself in an even worse place because that spouse you've married will never fulfill in every way that longing to have somebody in your life who's with you and for you. Now, hopefully, as you grow, it gets better, but they will never be everything you need them to be. They can't be. They will always be broken and sinful and sometimes hurtful. When we view marriage as an opportunity to just have a happier life, we miss the whole point. You see, Scripture from Genesis until Revelation paints this picture that marriage is not about you and it's not about me. It's not about us at all. Marriage is altogether about God working through you. God uniting the two of you together as one flesh. God coming into your midst to make you holy. Holy is a word we don't use very often and we often have negative connotations when we do. Holy quite literally means set apart, different unlike anything else. Marriage is not about your happiness, but your holiness. That you, through marriage, would be shaped and refined, 
and made into the very person God created you to be. And through your commitment in your marriage, your spouse would experience the same. And when both people seek marriage for the sake of happiness, what happens is at some point, the other person makes you no longer happy. But when you seek it for the sake of holiness, God, what is it you will do today? What is it you desire of us or from us? Where is it you are moving? When it becomes about being made different together, everything changes. Now Ezra's solution, what happens in the next chapter of the book, Ezra's solution to this problem is that everybody who's intermarried should get divorced. We often have the same solution today. Your marriage is tough. Things aren't going well. You no longer feel like you love them. Fine, just move on. Get divorced. It's okay. No big deal. Ezra's solution is if you have sinned to enter this marriage, the best thing you should do is leave it and get divorced. Now the text leaves us with a little bit of ambiguity. And we as the reader, we hear this text, we read this text, and we should be struck with something doesn't seem right. When Ezra commands all the people who have intermarried to get divorced, that should at least stir up in us a little bit of hesitation and frustration. That doesn't seem fair or right or just. In fact, what the text does in chapter 10 is it never tells us that this was God's desire, but rather Ezra's command, get divorced. Another author at the same time, Malachi, a contemporary of Ezra, somebody who was serving at the same time as Ezra, a prophet who was declaring the things God was doing and the promise of his coming. Malachi, he writes this in chapter two. He's describing how they've profaned the covenant A covenant is a relationship between two different people and God for an eternal promise. How they've made this covenant something unholy. And he's describing this and he says this in verse 15. Did not he, being God, did not God make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And was not God the one seeking Godly, or, and what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. As they have broken their marriage vows and they've been faithless and dishonorable, God calls them back, isn't my command that the two would become one and you'd be united and you would be faithful forever? Now this verse 16 is a little tricky. It's perhaps one of the most complicated Hebrew idioms in the Old Testament. So it's been translated in several different ways depending on the translation you look at. Some say, for the man who hates his wife and divorces her. This idea that it's only out of a lack of love and out of a place of hate that you then move into divorce. Any approach to divorce other than hate, there isn't one according to scripture. Others read the first half the same, for the man who does not love his wife but divorces her. And then they read the second half a little bit differently. And the way the second half is sometimes read is the Lord, the God of Israel, says that he hates divorce and him who covers his garment with violence. This idea that God himself hates divorce. And we have this language that he's covering his garment with violence This pretty ugly picture that by entering into the process of divorce, by separating from the one that God brought you together with, you're actually covering your life in violence and bloodshed, pain and sorrow. 
God hates divorce and him who covers his garment with violence. It's pretty strong words of a contemporary of Ezra. At the same time that Ezra is saying all of you should get divorced if you've married the wrong person, Malachi is saying you should never get divorced because what God has done, nobody should separate. It's a terrible thing. Now we live 2,400 years removed from Ezra and Malachi and we've learned a lot in the West and now we think that divorce, you should be able to do at any time for no fault of your own, it doesn't matter if something's not right, if you just don't feel it anymore, you should have the freedom to do that. And so a lot of people enter into marriage thinking, I love this person and I'll take these vows till death do us part. But if I decide at some point not to wait till death, it's only $500 and the lawyer will take care of it, no big deal. We'll get out of this and move on. Now before we come back to what this means for us today, I want to say this clearly. Our God is a God who's abundantly gracious and abundantly faithful and abundantly kind. He's slow to anger and he's abounding in steadfast love. And so if you've been divorced, there are some who would say, now you're out, you've screwed it up, you can't fix this. No, if you've been divorced, God still loves you today, tomorrow, and every day. And if you've been divorced, if you still are divorced, if you're in the process of getting a divorce, there's hope for you yet. The hope is this. What God has united, let no man separate. If the divorce is finalized, maybe there's a possibility of reconciliation. Maybe there's a chance that things could change in the future. Maybe not. If you're in the middle of seeking the divorce, maybe there's a really good time now to say, what could we do differently to make this relationship holy again? To make this union something God blesses again? And if you've been divorced and are remarried, I know that Jesus later says that that is the act of adultery, but here's the good news. The act of adultery is not the same as always being adulterous. Because every one of us, if we've looked at someone lustfully, we've committed the act of adultery. So if you've been divorced and are now remarried, here's the good news for you today. It's not too late for your marriage to become what God intended it to be. You see, for all of us, whether it's our first marriage or whether we've remarried, whether we married the wrong person or the perfect soulmate, whomever we marry, God has put us together with that for the rest of our life till death parts us, marriage can make us holy. He describes this process by saying, husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church. If you want to see your marriage become holy, something set apart and better than what this world has to offer, husbands, love the way Christ has loved, giving everything up for her sake. And wives, respect your husbands and honor them, even when they don't deserve it. And when the two of you seek not for your happiness but your holiness to place God as the center of your marriage, it's really good news. All kinds of sin and brokenness can be covered. All kinds of violence against us, hurt in our souls, emotional wounds can be healed. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow but they can be healed with God. Ezra, he reinforces this role of marriage for the people and says, if we want to be God's people, these relationships must be important and they must be holy. And his solution seems to be the wrong solution, but we can learn from him. Maybe today's the day to say, my marriage is not yet too far gone. Maybe today's the day to say, I want to be the husband my wife deserves, or at least the husband God has commanded me to be. So I'm going to seek forgiveness where I have wronged. 
I'm going to work with God on the things in me that are not good. Say, help me to honor my wife, to love her well. And oftentimes when marriage is talked about in the church, I was there once. I remember being single and hearing these things about marriage. being like, yeah, that's great for somebody else, but God hasn't given it to me yet. Let me just speak to those of you who are single. Singleness is not bad. And marriage is not the solution. And here's what I mean by that. I hope and pray for everybody who's single that someday God would give you a spouse because it truly is a wonderful gift. But if you are not enough without a spouse, if God isn't enough for you until you get married, if you are desperately in need of somebody else that you're willing to give or sacrifice everything and even maybe seek a relationship with somebody who doesn't walk with God and make you more holy, you're missing the point and you'll be wildly disappointed in marriage. So if you're single, it's okay to keep asking for a spouse. But in the meantime, maybe ask God to make you into the kind of person he wants you to be. This holy person who's set apart and different for his sake. This holy person, not judgmental person, this holy person who's, who's different, who chooses not to embrace the things the world says, but seek after God instead. And maybe in your singleness, as God creates that in you, you'll find contentment. Maybe you'll find a spouse. Either way, you'll be following after what God has for you. If you're here and you are divorced or seeking a divorce, maybe today's the day to admit where you've gone wrong. I have sinned and I need forgiveness. Begin by admitting that to God and then to your spouse or your ex. I wronged you, please forgive me. I believe when we as God's people take marriage as a holy thing and we hold to it as an important thing that we shouldn't just dismiss because we married the wrong person, but something we cling to because God has united us. When we have this attitude and this approach, we will see God at work in our singleness in our relationships, in our children, in all of our lives. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we confess that our sins are over our head. Every one of us holds to the wrong view of marriage at times. We treat our spouses as people to make us feel better, as there for our emotions and happiness. We treat the idea of marriage on this pedestal like it's the greatest thing. And yet it's not. You are, Lord. God, we pray for every single person, for every married person, for every divorced individual, for every widowed individual. God, we pray that marriage would be held among us as holy, as set apart as not to be entered into lightly, but a thing to rejoice in that you are uniting two people, not only in body and flesh, but in their soul. And may we work with everything in us to celebrate marriage, to honor it, to hold fast to what is good. God, not to get divorced because we can, but instead to draw near to you to seek your healing for what is hurting and what is broken. And in all things, Lord, may we find your peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.